Thanks very much, Leslie. So since we are recording tonight, which we want to do because, you know, there may be people who can't make it here tonight, but are very interested in the topic. If you do not like the idea of appearing on the screen during a recording, you know, please just uh, turn off your video. So, so that won't, uh, that won't happen. Uh, I'm Jack Lloyd. I'm one of the co-coordinators along with uh, Sylvia Huth of the Province 5 Migration Ministry Network. I'm from Chicago, and Sylvia is from the Detroit area. And Province 5, if you're not familiar with it, covers six uh, Midwestern states. So uh, Episcopal Diocese in, in six Midwestern states are part of uh, Province 5. And our network, our Migration Ministry Network, uh, this is actually the you know, the uh, bi-monthly meeting of the Migration Ministry Network. We meet every couple of months, and it's people from all over the province who are interested in pro-immigrant uh, issues, trying to make an impact in welcoming our newly arriving brothers and sisters in Province 5, and we share information about what we're doing and what the problems are and what kind of challenges we're facing and try to help each other uh, in every way we can. We also connect with Episcopal Migration Ministries so we're trying to be a, uh, a resource that can connect people within our province who are interested in these issues and connect as well to the, to the church's national uh, response to these issues. So we invite you to, you know, if you find this webinar interesting, uh, to uh, join up with us and show up at future uh, bi-monthly meetings of the Province 5 Migration Ministry Network uh, as well. We have an unusually big turnout tonight so that's great to see because we have a special uh webinar to share with you and betsy soul who is a parishioner at saint john's in uh plymouth michigan has a story to tell you about her work as a parishioner there who got excited about an idea for helping refugees and was able to through her creativity and energy and work uh make something uh, happen that's that's quite exciting in terms of uh, the ability to provide help for a refugee family that will be arriving and taking advantage of it very soon in in Plymouth so I'll turn it over to uh Betsy but after about a half an hour 35 minutes something like that Betsy tells me her presentation will take we would like to just open it up for a kind of a Q&A session discussion session there are others on the on the call who have information about their efforts to uh, help migrate migrants in our territory and uh, to, so to share that information as well as to ask Betsy questions about how she's accomplished what uh, St. John's has accomplished uh, is kind of the, the latter part of the, the presentation tonight. But Betsy, I'll let you take it away and uh, tell the story about what's uh, what's happening at St. John's in Plymouth, Michigan. Okay. Um... Nice to see you all here tonight, and um, we'd like to start with a prayer. Um, this prayer was given to me by a friend several years ago, and I know if you're if you've chosen to be here tonight, you're someone with a concern for people in deep need, and I just like to invite you to pray this prayer with me for yourself as I begin. Heavenly Father, let my eyes be your eyes sharing your compassion, warmth, and love. Let my hands be your hands, bringing healing with their touch. Let my ears be your ears, listening where there is need. Let my words be your words, bringing comfort, joy, and peace. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, um, the question I asked myself as I prepared for this webinar was, what can I say that will be helpful to another church? Because what happened here in uh, at St. at uh, St. John's is unique. It's not a step-by-step how-to. There's no cookie cutter approach. It has been and still is a series of asking, now, now what do we do and who can help us with this next challenge? A major part of that help has been Bishop Bonnie Perry and the Episcopal Diocese of Michigan, and also the experience and expertise of Samaritas, 
which is uh, Samaritas is part of the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services and is the government designated resettlement agency for this part of Michigan. We never could have done this without them. There are a few of us who saw a need and an asset, and we started to talk about it to some others and ask some questions. And as it inched towards becoming a reality, we began to realize that we were being drawn into a work of the Holy Spirit that God had pre been preparing us to be a part of. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah talk about two men who wanted to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. So they asked the king for help, and he supported them. And as they worked to overcome all the obstacles and red tape and the people renew their commitment to God, Ezra and Nehemiah both write, the good hand of God was upon me. I think we at St. John's can relate to that. I think it's kind of an Old Testament saying the Holy Spirit was there. Anyway, one framework for thinking about this is to realize that we can only be who we are see what we have, and then do what matters to God. This is who we are. This is what we have. And this is at least one thing that matters to God. Now, I know a seed was planted for me when I was around 10 years old, and I was growing up in Minneapolis, and our church sponsored a young man who was a Hungarian refugee. This is a picture of him with my dad. Um, my dad is Andy Thompson, and there's Alex Heady. And they became very good friends, and my dad was his best man at his wedding. And actually, our families were friends for the rest of my parents' lives. So here's some information to start with so you know a little bit more about St. John's. <clears throat> Before COVID, our attendance average was about 105. After the pandemic, it was around 80 to 85 with another 15 online. Our annual budget is 220,000. We have a mid-century building that is difficult and expensive to maintain. We do not have an endowment fund. Some of our challenges were due to people not coming to church, difficult working relationships, many lay ministries were ending, an aging congregation, until now, we've been through almost five years with two different interim priests and weeks on end with different supply priests. So what are the factors that made our vestry decide to support this? The first approval was only that I had permission to explore the possibility of reno renovating our former rectory and youth center. And after talking to other churches who were already supporting uh, refugee resettlement, and especially the support of our interim priest. And we also had the hope that another large Episcopal church that had raised a sizable fund to help refugees would help us. And I was told to gather more information. Well, it turned out the other church needed their funds uh, for the several families that they supported. So then what changed for us? This is Father John Connors, our interim priest, um, who's also online with us here, who shared with us that he began his tenure with a clear and powerful experience that God was calling him to St. John's for a purpose. He was with us for nearly three and a half years as we struggled on, but recognized that this project was what the Holy Spirit had been calling him to. This slide is from our farewell uh, reception for him. And now we have welcomed our new rector, Pastor Chris Fentress Gannon, who shared with me that St. John's House for New Americans is one of the reasons she wanted to come to our church. Father John shared with us the story of Holy Apostles Episcopal Church in New York City. In the 1980s, it was a dying church ready to close when they decided to do one significant thing before that happened. They began to offer meals to hungry people on the street near them. The church himself, itself is still about the size of St. John's, but now their services, in addition to feeding people, require a budget of almost $3 million a year. For us, the beginning point was only the belief for my husband and I that we needed to stay at St. John's and help. Another inspiration has been the Presbyterian Church in Plymouth. 
they have been an example of a way to think of ministry, and for me, actually, a better understanding of evangelism. First Press has had a tiny thrift shop in town for a number of years. It was tucked away in a semi-commercial and residential neighborhood, and they barely made enough each month to pay the rent. Then a woman with a vision led the effort to move to a larger and more visible part of town, and they have welcomed anyone who wants to help them. Now, after 73 years, every penny they make goes to supporting over 25 national and local overseas missions. They have a volunteer staff of 70. They have so many donations that the Refugee Resettlement Agency brings large family to help themselves with any household goods and clothes they need. Every week, AMVET stops by to take anything the sh thrift shop can't use. And I, I just love this example because it was obvious to me that St. John's was not going to be able to provide a home and support services for a refugee family unless we included more than St. John's members. We knew it had to be a community effort, and I knew that more people than just refugee families would be impacted by inviting anyone to help. We have no idea how the Holy Spirit will use these relationships so that others might know the presence of God in their lives. Our role, we believe, is to demonstrate the love of Jesus. So here's the story of what happened. St. John's has a large colonial house on our property that served as the rectory for many years and was later remodeled as a youth center. When the youth ministry ended, it sat empty for several years and became the place to store Christmas decorations and whatever people didn't know what to do with. And this is how it started. We had an empty house, large enough for a family of eight to 10. Then the Afghan government collapsed and refugees flooded into Michigan in the midst of a housing crisis. I asked our priests and vestry if we could explore using the house for refugee families, and they agreed to that first step. Refugees are usually able to be self-sufficient in about six or about 12 to 18 months, and then we would welcome another family. So this is can be an ongoing and growing ministry. This is our plan. We requested permission but from the diocese to remodel the house for refugee families. And we presented the proposal to proceed at our annual meeting in 2022, and the vote was nearly unanimous, one no and two abstentions. And we received contractor bids that indicated that we would need $105,000 to proceed. We upped it to $120,000 because we all know about um, contract work. So we applied for a, a diocesan grant for bricks and mortar, which is usually an award of around $15,000. We received $40,000 from the diocese. And this has, we were told this has never happened in anyone's recent memory, but it was such an encouragement and confirmation. Then we had a display at our diocesan convention and some other Episcopal churches and individuals responded with help. These other church, local churches besides First Presbyterian have both given money and personal support. St. Paul's in Brighton purchased all the cleaning supplies and a vacuum cleaner. Holy Cross and Novi bought the hot water heater. The women from Living Peace Church in Plymouth have organized and supplied the kitchen and have taken the safe church training so they can care for children during the ESL class that we're starting. Um, the Plymouth Rotary, too, has given us uh, financial support and personal encouragement right from the start. And we realized that we had a lot in common. We have shared values that really um, forged the foundation for a partnership with them. They have paid for all the new appliances in the kitchen. This is Beth Stewart. I was uh, at the uh, meeting when I spoke to the Rotary and uh, they were listening and she just said that, you know, this is something we can do right here in Plymouth to help out. So it's been great working with them. Um, so then Plymouth Today is a magazine that comes out every two months and goes to every household in our zip code. The issue that came out in November 2022 had an article about St. John's Resort, which is just about one mile from our church down the road. 
it's a former Catholic cemetery, uh, so seminary the site that now boasts a hotel, a restaurant, and a golf course. And it was owned by the church until a couple of years ago when the Pulte Foundation purchased it. And now it is, uh, they're in the process of upgrading it into a premier resort and wedding venue. So at the end of the article, the purpose of the, uh, about this resort, the purpose of the Pulte Foundation is stated, and it's based on Matthew 25. All their profits, you can see there, are um, all their profits are, um, I lost my please, sorry. <laughs> um, they're used um, to clothe the naked, care for the captives, and shelter the homeless and more. When I read that, I thought, that's what we're doing, and maybe they'll help us. So I found the number of the reporter who wrote the article and asked her for a contact at the resort. She gave me that, but after we spoke for a few minutes, she said, this is so interesting. I want to write an article about this. So um, she came to St. John's to interview us last November, and she mentioned that she had grown up in a Catholic family, but really hadn't been involved in the church at all for years. I asked the other day, I got, or I called her the other day to see if she had a picture of herself for this. And I told her how her information had resulted in the St. John's Resort working together with Samaritas to provide employment and a place to refugees to live at the resort. And her response was, well, that was the Holy Spirit. So here's the article. Um, here's the Plymouth um, Today magazine. And then here's Diane's article. Um, to back up a bit, after I talked to Diane, I then called the contact person at the resort and left a message. And then when I received a call back and explained what I called about, the response was, this is really something because we are planning on hiring refugees to work at the resort. We would like to meet with you about this. So the result was a meeting with uh, some Samaritan staff the foundation representative and the chief operating officer. Not only have they established a long-term relationship with Samaritas, but as part of the new hotel addition, they are building one floor with 10 apartments for refugees who are working at the resort and need housing. And there's the wing. And I think it's the, um, I think it's the second floor from the top is where the, the apartments are going to be. So, um, when the article in the Plymouth Today came out, uh, we got a few more offers to help and some donations. But then one afternoon, I received a call from our NBC local station asking if they could interview me for the evening news. It was a three and a half minute segment, as well as a tour of the house. They talked about the need for funding of St. John's House and asked me how we decided to do this. But there was excellent coverage uh, about the refugee crisis worldwide and how many thousands are being sent to Michigan to resettle. So after uh, that, a call came from the Episcopal News Service asking about St. John's House. And the resulting article from that was picked up by a local hometown newspaper. A reporter came to the church to interview us and her article was then also published in the Detroit Free Press. So we still hadn't reached our goal. I think we were about $30,000 short at that time. And I was combing the internet looking for possibilities. We have a bit of a handicap in looking for money because we're, um, we're a lot of grant giving organizations, they wanna see that you're helping a lot of people very quickly and we're helping a few people kind of slow. <laughs> But I found the Masco Corporation that is headquartered right here in this part of Michigan. And the Masco was actually started by an immigrant years ago. Their website states that they give grants for bricks and mortar endeavors, but absolutely no information on how to apply. So I called the head of donations at Samaritas and asked if she knew anyone at Masco. And she did have a contact from some time ago. And on a Monday, she wrote to her. On Tuesday, she got this response. Yes, I remember you. And it's interesting that you contacted me because my colleague just walked in my office with an article from Plymouth Today and said, shouldn't we help these people? So we want to meet with you on Zoom on Thursday and find out more. 
So on Thursday, we met with the two MASCO representatives, me and, and some staff from Samaritas, to tell them about St. John's House for New Americans. On Friday morning, I opened my email and read, we will give you $25,000 plus and products from the companies that we own. Masco happens to be one of the largest suppliers to Home Depot. They own Bear Paints, Delta Faucets, Kitchler Lighting, and several other smaller companies that would have what we needed. We went back to the contractor and asked him to give us another quote, allowing for the items that were to be donated. And instead of 105,000, the quote was now 87,000. So we had $95,000. We were able to start construction in April and finish at the end of August, this past August. So at this point, I want to tell you um, about three people, Dan McGregor, Andy Bagnasco, and Lisa Sanders. And a couple of them are in this picture with some other helpers. I, it was, I, there was no way I was going to get these three people together. They're so busy. But if not for them, this pro project would still be on paper. The diocese requires someone from the church to be a site manager to work with a contractor. So my first thought is how in the world am I gonna find someone to do that? The answer was that God had been preparing some people to help. Andy lives five minutes from the church. Sometimes he can do his job as a Ford engineer when he's working from home. As a homeowner, he's done a lot of remodeling on his own. I cannot count the number of times he has had to run over to church to do things as, such as open the house for an inspection, go to Home Depot for lumber or small plumbing item or dispose of old appliances and just on and on. Dan is a newer member of St. John's. One Sunday while talking to his wife, I mentioned that we needed another person to work with Andy. She responded, my husband can do that. He works full time as a project manager but he inspects houses on weekends and he's familiar with all the building codes. Dan <laughs> jokingly says he got voluntold, but his, his knowledge and advice has been so essential in working with a contractor as well as in he's installed and fixed many items that weren't listed in the contract. It would take me hours to tell you what these two men have done to turn the house into a home for a family of eight. I also knew I wouldn't be able to handle all the details of furnishing the house, but I remembered that Lisa had an interior design business. So when I called her, she said she had already been wondering how she could help. And just deciding what we would need, managing the in-kind donations from Masco and coordinating all the donations and where to put them has been a monumental job of planning and record keeping. This project has been an opportunity for all kinds of people to share their passions and gifts and talents to make a difference. Here's Lisa's comment about what motivated her to help. This special project was a natural fit with my expertise as a color and design consultant. And what better way to use one talent than to benefit a family looking for a better life? This is Scotty Guthrie, who owns a roofing company in Ann Arbor. And he brought his crew to donate the labor to fix the back porch and the handicap ramp that we have. And the house is furnished with loving gifts from people all over the community. The quilts on the beds are all handmade by the woman of First Presbyterian. The new washer and dryer donated by our interim priest, Father John. A new TV from a neighbor and there's a, a shoe cubby that looks like a piece of furniture. It's beautiful. Donate, it was made by a hobby car carpenter and he just called me and he said, what can I do? I have a lot of tools. Um, he's even helped a lot with a painting in the house anyway. And then there's a beauty salon that has offered to give the family haircuts when they come. So another opportunity has already been established as an outgrowth of the refugee house. We are working with the local literacy council in the school district to offer beginning ESL classes at the church on Tuesday mornings. We have six trained ESL tutors and five women with safe church training who will share the childcare responsibilities for the parents in the class. 
This is a huge need for both refugees and immigrants and will provide a meeting at the church every week for people with common concerns and will be an additional support for the family living in St. John's house. We've been told that a family is due to arrive at St. John's House for New Americans sometime in the next few weeks. And no one can be more surprised than me than that we have been able to accomplish something of this size. Any of us who have a personal relationship with God can look back on our lives and we can see how that relationship has given us experiences that have made us who we are and how that impacts the choices we make about how we spend our lives. If our work is where God has placed us in our work and our families and our community to be ambassadors for the kingdom of God by expressing the love of Christ in word and deed, then we can trust the Holy Spirit to draw people into relationship with God. If we only have friends at church and rely on publicity and online presence, how are we going to have the type of relationship where we could someday have a conversation about faith or maybe just plant a seed that bears spiritual fruit later. Many people want to make a, do something to make a difference for good. So we invite others to participate in ministry, whether or not they are members of our church or of any faith community at all. I love to share what happened has happened at St. John's. But there's really no way to it can be copied exactly. It is a unique work of the Holy Spirit. I think that outreach ministries that are uh, similar have a few things in common. One is that people are praying about what is ahead for their faith community. Another is um, there's usually a small core of people who have vision and passion to believe that God may be calling them to a ministry and they have enough determination, time, and faith to see it through. And these things did all come together at St. John's. The other piece is to start with what you have. God can multiply that. We had a house that we own, no mortgage, unused, and in decent shape. In New York, Holy Apostles Church had a kitchen and decided to feed a few homeless people. There are some examples in scripture. The widow of Zarephath had a little oil and flour. A boy had some bread and fish. A poor woman had one penny. Ezra knew the scriptures. David had a slingshot. St. John's wanted to help refugees to meet some of their physical needs as well as learning English. But we also wanted to find ways for anyone to have an encounter with a living God, not only because we're helping one family at a time, but by being Christ Church involved in the community. We hope and pray that God can use our gifts and service to others so they might experience the presence of Christ in their own lives.